changed the festival to kind of curatorial your tone a little bit be focusing on Africa of all po possibilities. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy uh, with the with the outcome and the and the turnout of the festival, I worked with Chimamanda Adichie uh, to uh, on the uh, on the lineup and programming too. Uh, tonight, tonight I saw that we're going to present some of the three most surprising uh, writers from our lineup to provide some lim limelight and, and provide the limelight and also the kind of like the a, the opportunity to for you to get them know somewhat better. And I cannot be more uh, happier. Them to have here uh, uh, Ivan Avur, Alan Mabonku, and Adewale Ajadi. I asked uh, Andy Tepper, one of our longtime friends and contributors from Vanity Fair, to introduce this evening and actually uh, guide us through this somewhat uh, special arrangement. She's going to explain the choreography of the evening. Welcome the, them all, please. And Andy, please explain the choreography of the evening. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the 11th annual Penn World Voices Festival with its special focus on Africa and African writers this year. And uh, welcome to a Friday night, uh, spring night in New York City with a wonderful weekend event still to come. Um, and welcome to tonight's program, 90 Minutes and Three Minds. Um, I'm not included in the three minds. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll be your moderator tonight and before jumping into the program, I want to just quickly explain the uh, format. So as Jakob said, the, the idea is instead of a straight panel discussion, we wanted to try for something a little bit more dynamic, fast-paced, and a little different with three writers who are um, incredibly dynamic and unique themselves. And thank you for, for being such great sports tonight. So the plan is to have each come up individually for a short uh, question and answer. Um, uh, answer my fairly general rapid fire stock questions and then um, and hopefully it won't seem too much like a game show or uh, the dating game or something and then uh, they'll do a reading and um, and then we'll bring all three up together to, to have an open conversation followed by 20 minutes or so uh, questions from the audience and then a book signing afterwards so I'm really really genuinely very thrilled to be here with these three writers Ivan Awar's de debut, Dust, is truly an amazing novel, breathtaking, overflowing, reminded me in ways of Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things, but in completely original voice, with a stirring, invented language, vivid, unforgettable characters, and a panoramic view of modern Kenya, its politics, its history, and its parched and dusty landscape. Uh, and as for Alain Mabanku, who's originally from Congo Brazzaville and now teaching at UCLA. It, um, I've been greedily uh, and joyfully reading him for almost the past decade or so. His clever, riotous, wickedly biting and subversive books like African Psycho, Broken Glass, and Memoirs of a Porcupine and more. It's a real pleasure to meet up again. We did a, a World Voices event several years ago and it's also a thrill to see him recognized uh, being shortlisted shortlisted for the International Man Booker Prize, which will be announced later this month. And the Nigerian writer Adewale Ajadi, who I just met this week, uh, immediately impressed me with the range of his work and deep thinking, not just about his country, Nigeria, but about all of Africa as well. He's written a historical play set in Ethiopia, Abyssinia, a nonfiction book on Nigeria in the 21st century, and is working on peace initiatives in the Niger, uh, Niger River Delta and produces a reality TV program set in the region as well. And uh, I believe he's also now working on a novel which he'll read from tonight, a work in progress. So let's get right into it. Um, so the order we came up with is uh, <laughs> the first penalty kick taker is Alan Mabanku. So welcome Alan Mabanku, please. Yeah, I think so. 
So Alan will be reading from Broken Glass, his novel, with a translator. So he'll read from Fren in French. Um, so should we start with the questions and then the reading? It depends on you, if you want. I think, yeah, I think so. I think we were going to do that. Question, <laughs> reading, what do you want? Uh, let's do the questions first. Okay. And then you'll get a sense of the writer, and then we'll get into the, uh, the reading. So here are my questions on uh, index cards. <coughs> so Alan, where do you live and write? Oh, that's uh, <laughs> complicated. A deep question. <laughs> I think that uh, I live with my character, and I write with them. So we travel together, because I can write uh, in a hotel room, in a bar, everywhere. I know that uh, my characters don't have uh, a citizenship. I have the citizenship of, uh, of my readers. If you are reading my book, you're going to be, for that time, a Congolese reader. Mm. And that may be the the great thing in literature, how to make like an American thing for a while that he is just uh, a Congolese who is like going to Pointe Noire, Brazzaville, Congo River, and so on and so on. Do you have a desired audience in mind when you write? A specific audience in mind? No, because having a desired audience does mean that you are writing because someone is like whispering you something to do. You, know, you need to write that, put a little bit of sex, na, 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 in order to increase your readers. So I don't write like that. I write because I'm not feeling very well. <laughs> so if I feel that um, sometimes I would try to write, but things are not coming. Uh, just to put like uh, a music from the 60s reminding me my own mother and then yeah. I'm gonna see like the character who are like dancing what we call the rumba congolese slowly and slowly and all of a sudden you see the character whispering something to write uh, and then you're gonna be like in the mood of writing so I don't care if I'm going to be read by French people, by American, by Japanese, but I care just uh, what I'm writing, if it fits, if I feel that, oh, that's what I wanted to express, and that's the character I wanted to depict. What, what language or languages do you use in your work? The, the seven Congolese language Languages I speak, you know, Bembe, Congo, mm -hmm. Dondo, Teke, Vili, Kamba, and uh, Lari. I speak seven of the Congolese languages, but at the same time, I have French. Mm -hmm. So French uh, is specific because uh, if, I, if I write in French, but the background is Congolese. Mm -hmm. Yes, the words mm -hmm. are in French, but the substance are in African languages. W what role does history in the past, distant or recent, play in your works? I like playing with history. You know, I, in France, I'm known because uh, I don't think that uh, a black man should spend his time crying because uh, he was a slave at the time. He was colonized. So you need to move forward. What is important for me is the present, even if I have to look back to the past in order to understand what to do for the future. But uh, if you have someone who is just crying instead of building, then I think that is going in front of the wall. So my uh, writing are about uh, the present, a little bit the past, but mainly the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And w what is your relationship to the older independence era generation of African writers? And do you feel a connection or shared vision with, with a newer generation of African writers 
across the continent and abroad. <laughs> I'm looking like a student here. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, each time I'm like uh, listening to people saying new generation, new generation. You have always a writer, they're going to say the most talented of his generation. So in literature, the, de the generation doesn't exist. It's how you're going to deal with what have been written and what is being uh, uh, written and what you have to put in the, on the table in order to move forward. So for the last generation, last, like Leopold Sedar Senghor, Aimé Césaire, uh, it was important for us to understand who is a black man, what Africa means, and um, what the relationship between Africa and Europe, and so on and so on. After that, this kind of literature, which was uh, very important in order to express the power of the blackness. Now, I need to express the power of a character who is like devastated, uh, who are destroyed by the world. I, I need to put an African in the middle of the world which is like, uh, uh, like falling apart, to quote uh, Achebe's title. So we need at that time to express the single voice. I'm not uh, a fan of a kind of uh, common literature in which everybody is singing the same song, dancing the same dance. When you are singing that song, I want to sing the other one. So um, I, I, I would prefer to sing the, a kind of uh, song from a bird who is encaged if you see to yeah. whom I'm yeah. trying to yeah. uh, say hi somewhere. <laughs> eh? Maya Angelou, yeah. who is, uh, yes. We need this kind of song. So African literature was like uh, committed. We need a kind of African literature w w which is engaged personally. I don't want to receive like orders from someone who will go and like uh, stop uh, the starvation over there. No. If I want to get engaged, I'm going to do it by myself. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. And now you'd like to read the opening of yes. Broken Glass. So in French, uh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Disons que le patron du bar le crédit à voyager m'a remis un cahier que je dois remplir et il croit dur qu'on faire que moi vers cassé je peux pondre un livre parce que en plaisantant je lui avais raconté un jour l'histoire d'un écrivain célèbre qui vivait comme une éponge un écrivain qu'on allait même ramasser dans la rue quand il était ivre faut donc pas présenter avec le patron parce que il prend tout au premier degré Et lorsqu'il m'avait remis ses cahiers, il avait tout de suite précisé que c'était pour lui, pour lui tout seul, que personne d'autre ne le lirait. Et alors, j'ai voulu savoir pourquoi il tenait tant à ses cahiers. Il a répondu qu'il ne voulait pas que le crédit à voyager disparaisse un jour comme ça. Il a ajouté que les gens de ces pays n'avaient pas le sens de la conservation de la mémoire, que l'époque des histoires que racontait la grand-mère Grabataire était finie que l'heure était désormais à l'écrit parce que c'est ce qui reste la parole c'est de la fumée noire du pupi des chats sauvages le patron du crédit à voyager n'aime pas les formules toutes faites du genre en Afrique quand un vieillard meurt c'est une bibliothèque qui brûle et lorsqu'il entend ces clichés bien développés il est plus que vexé et il lance aussitôt ça dépend de quel vieillard Arrêtez donc vos conneries, je n'ai confiance qu'en ce qui est écrit. Ainsi, c'est un peu pour lui faire plaisir que je griffonne de temps à autre, sans vraiment être sûr de ce que je raconte ici. Je ne cache pas que je commence à y prendre goût depuis un certain temps, 
Mais toutefois, je me garde de lui avouer, sinon il s'imaginerait des choses et me pousserait encore plus à l'ouvrage. Or, je veux garder ma liberté d'écrire quand je veux, quand je peux. Il n'y a rien de pire que le travail forcé. Je ne suis pas son nègre. J'écris aussi pour moi-même. Et c'est pour cette raison que je n'aimerais pas être à sa place au moment où il parcourra ces pages dans lesquelles je ne tiens à ménager personne. Mais quand il ira tout ça, je ne serai plus un client de son bar. J'irai traîner mon corps squelettique ailleurs. Je lui ai re remis le document à la dérobée en lui disant « Mission terminée ». Ah, J'ai déjà la lunette. Même. Plus gros, ça. Ça va Let's say the boss of Bar Credit Gone West gave me this notebook to fill. He's convinced that I, broken glass, can turn out a book. Because one day, for a laugh, I told him about this famous writer who drank like a fish and had to be picked up off the street when he got drunk, which shows you, you should never joke with the boss. He takes everything literally. And when he gave me this notebook, he said from the start it was only for him. No one else would read it. And when I asked why he was so set on this notebook, he said he didn't want credit gone west just to vanish one day and added, that people in this country have no sense of the importance of memory, that the day when grandmothers reminisced from their deathbeds was gone now. This is the age of the written word. That's all that's left. The spoken words, just black smoke, wildcats piss. The boss of Credit Gone West doesn't like ready-made phrases like, in Africa when an old person dies, a library burns. Every time he hears that worn out cliche, he gets mad. He'll say, depends on which old person. Don't talk crap. I only trust what's written down. So I thought I'd jot a few things down here from time to time just to make him happy. I'm not sure what I'm saying. I admit I've begun to quite enjoy it. I won't tell him that though. He'll, he'll get ideas and start to push me to do more and more. And I want to be free to write when I want when I can. There's nothing worse than forced labor. I'm not his ghost. I'm writing this for myself as well. That's why I wouldn't want to be in his shoes when he reads these pages. I don't intend to spare him or anyone else. By the time he reads this, though, I'll no longer be one of his customers. I'll be dragging my bag of bones about some other place. Just slip him the document quietly before I go, saying, mission accomplished. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for the translation. And now, you, Yvonne, will you come up? <laughs> okay. right. And after Yvonne, Adwele will come, and then we'll all come together and uh, have a conversation. Welcome, Yvonne. <laughs> so, same questions, I guess, same order. I can always shuffle them up if that would help. But um, where, d wh where do you live and write? Um, it's I complicated also, right? No, no, actually, it's pretty simple. I, I'm currently living in Nairobi. Um, I write uh, when the muse lets me write. I like to pretend that I'm writing now, but actually I'm not. <laughs> so I, I write when I can. Do, do you have a desired audience in mind when you write? <laughs> and, um, I think that's the lesson I learned from Das um, uh, I think it's uh, the audience mostly it's a very, in a very strange way. The audience seems to be um, uh, the people who people the story. Yeah. And what what language or languages do you do you write in? Do you work? Do you uh, I think maybe English is the base chord, <laughs> but then then everything else that uh, emerges out of that um, could be any language. Uh, the, the languages of um, you know, of the characters. Uh, I've got a character that's Chinese. I don't speak Chinese, but the characters do. So uh, my job is to listen and figure that out. Mm. 
what role does history in the past uh, play in your works? I, history, I, I find history uh, a kind of fascinating space. Uh, just an incredible landscape of possibility. I use history, certainly as a Kenyan, to annoy uh, the political state. I, I dig, I dig, I dig, I, I dig into the abyss of history. I'm curious about the silences embedded within history, the things that are said, the things that are not said, the things that are admitted to, and the things that are not admitted to. And I'm curious especially about the, um, called the dark spaces within the historical space. And what, what is the, the relationship in your work to the uh, older generation of African writers? And do you feel a connection or shared vision with, with young writers today from the continent? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, you know, when you say older generation African writer, I think of uh, all the ones that were imposed upon me in school and mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. The, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Heinemann series. We learn the books yeah. and, and write about them. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, there's a mild resentment sometimes, mm -hmm. but of course I love them dearly, and mm -hmm. without them I wouldn't be writing myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a connection, past, present, future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yvonne. Would you, you'd like to read from Dust? Mm. Okay, I'll, Do I'll you want to set up the characters? Or? Or yeah, no? okay. Um, I'll read from the, uh, the, the start of the book, somewhere, somewhere close to the beginning. And our character, our female character, um, enters into the space where she understands that uh, uh, the people she loves, one, a person she particularly loves, is gone. Here, she could paint this, hold the brush as a stabbing knife. There, coloring in landscapes of loss, she could draw this for him this longing to hear his particular voice, listening for echoes of bloodied footsteps, borrowing dead eyes to help her find him again. Here, jagged precipices of woundings and over cliffs, an immense waterfall of yearning, falling and falling into nothingness. Her father, Agri Nipero Ganda, is a slender, dark stone statue in front of her. Only his eyes roam spaces, taking everything in, the emptiness too. Eyes reddened and popping out, shadowy tear streaks on an ebony face. His old policeman posture ends intact, straight, stiff, steady. His old world dapper in a slightly shabby 1970s coat and a 1950s brown leather fedora, tinged with the gray of age, clandestine wrinkles congregate at the corners of his eyes. As with so many men of Kenya from his time, his manner is genteel English colonial, stranded in time's paradoxes. A twist deforms Ajan's full lips. Here, the evidence. They are descendants of a lineage of living dead. Breathing in, she shifts her body to stare at a beige coffin habitat of the new and unquiet dead on a day when distorted election results will set a bucolic country afire. The outside world is drenched with human noises of accusations and counter accusations, election rigging and the miracle of mathematical votes that multiply and divide themselves. But within their world, in a self-contained haunted compound, with its lone, misshapen gravillia tree upon which a purple-blue bird tweets, and where death prowls at half past three, Ajan bends forward to listen to and for her brother, Odidi, whose story word had created vessels that always carried her into safe border. Hours ago, inside a morgue with this forgotten dead, the unprepared dead and the happy dead, a chill had turned all their hands a pale yellow, same shade as Moses Odidi Oganda's long, thick fingers. They had rummaged among the discarded dead in order to find and retrieve their own. Post-autopsy, after smoke-stained attendants had stitched him together again, father and sister had dressed Odidi up. Olive khaki suit, black socks and tan leather shoes. Purchases from a heart-closed, guarded nearby mall, 
whose managers balance the fear of waiting for hell's inevitable descent with a thirst to milk the last flow of money from panicking citizens. By 3.30, documents signed, all protocol adjusted and therefore observed, Moses of Beresit or Didi Uganda was officially dead. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you. Adwele, you're up next and last. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to New York. <laughs> Good. So you're ready. Well, <laughs> Good evening. So where do you live and write? Oh. Well, I live in Nigeria most of the time, and I write everywhere I find myself. <laughs> so I have the good fortune of being able to travel to different places in the world, and I gather stories as I go um, all the time. And do, do you have an audience in mind when you write? Huh. Actually, I look for people to collaborate by reading my work, so I don't write with anybody in mind who's going to be lazy. So I write for people whose imagination will connect with my thoughts, you know, I come from the Yoruba people, and we say in Yoruba, simply that I only tell you enough for you to make your own meaning from it. So I give as much, and hopefully those who read my books or my work will make their own meaning out of it. And what language or languages do you use in your work? Well, Yoruba sometimes, but certainly English. And what role does history in the past play in your works? Well, a big part. I have a sense that that sense of history is actually manufactured. And I also think that we can see the same thing from many different lenses. So there is a sense that my life is a continuation of the contract with my ancestors, myself, and posterity. So I go between those three, three timelines regularly. And do you feel a connection to a previous generation of African writers? <laughs> well, in a sense, I don't, because writing is a very lonely work. I, I don't have any sense that anybody who doesn't share my values directs what I write. I have a respect for their effort. I'm always curious about what younger people are doing. And I essentially find that there is a collective in Nigeria of young writers who write poetry, stories, and such like. And I find them fascinating. Thank you. And, and you're going to read from a work in progress uh, fiction. Yes. Um, this is still a work in progress. <laughs> and most certainly, um, this is about somebody whose husband was dead, and she's been put in a, in a sanatorium, accused of defiling his body. So she's writing a diary as part of her therapy. As I sat opposite him, I felt this unshakable sense of destiny, watching him settle into a seat. His facial expressions change between concentrated confidence and slightly openly in smiles. I was irritated by his good spirit. I went after him with cutness and barely disguised disdain. I started questioning the relation between his world of ideas and any serious attempt to address African material needs. So why should we care about your ideas for Africa? It is widely said that if Africa fell into the ocean and disappeared, the world would not notice commercially. In fact, it, was, it would be a sigh of relief. He smiled. He tried to respond, but I, would, I wouldn't have it yet. I engaged in a well-practiced light cynicism designed especially to put uppity black men in their place. I rapidly fire out condescending and simplistic questions. For most observers, the best of Africa was achieved under colonial rule. And as was shown in recent surveys, many Africans agree. So if Africa cannot rule itself, why should we anyone listen to, to these ideas? I covered any grain of compassion with a liberal dose of disdain. I queried the desperate failure of the African worldview. Is any attempt at African development not wasted? Consider its litany of failures, 
disposition for corruption, its creativity at self-destruction. Is this diaspora economics not just fantasy? I was enthralled by my question and did not prepare for the force of his passion. His eyes were firmly glued to mine. I noticed their deep-set almond shape resting with ease on either side of his nose. I felt embarrassed by the level of physical detail. I was willing to take it. His voice rose firmly as if to restore dialogue and interrupt the imagined physicality. So you think poverty of material is the same as lack of wisdom, he asked. The unexpected pity that accompanied his question made me struggle not to rudely assert that I was the interviewer. And, not def and, and he did not defend himself, but went further into direct attack. His language smile added to my sense of distraction. I fought to mask my response, even though I felt like a rabbit caught in the full headlight. He moved beyond my hastily formed protest to the core of his argument. Culture is the sum total of the wisdom that a people have. It is what they've gathered over the life of their ancestors to date. Many Africans have had their cultures manipulated, degraded, denigrated under the propaganda of superiority of Western ideas. You barely post for bread. You wear your ignorance like a badge. Without mass migration from Africa, there will be no humans anywhere else. This immigration is what shaped the world. It continued like a whirlwind. You think you can control and discipline that which spawned you? Well, this is why, poor as she may be, Africa is wiser. She knows the limitation of human knowledge compared to what is yet to be revealed. She has experienced far more than the rest of the world put together. The pain of change, the embarrassment of riches, yet she remains humble. Thank you. Thank you, Adwele. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Are we set? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I just wanted to start with um, maybe you, Alan, Broken Glass. The character Broken Glass is, is this writer, and I know it's very important, uh, the writer figure. You also have in Memoirs of a Porcupine, you know, he's writing. But at the same time, you're also um, uh, mocking and subverting a, a, a lot of the literary traditions. Um, Negritude and other writers, but so tell me about the writer figure in your work. As I'm thinking, uh, Broken Glass is uh, the main character is a writer. African Psycho is also a he's novel in which someone is writing, writing a about, diary, right? Yeah. Um, memoir for Porcupine right. as well, and I think Blue White Red also. I think I need to find a kind of al al alibi in order to write a novel. So instead of uh, putting my own life in risk, I uh, often hide myself behind someone who is writing. So I need like uh, to be like someone who is watching uh, television in which someone is watching television. You know, so <laughs> that 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 my, my my writing, I need like to uh, express how the writer could be the main character of the book. So it's easy for me to begin like that yeah. because the writer is the, the person I know the most in the world. I know the sorrow, the pain, how to write, how it's very difficult to write the first word. Sometimes you are so excited that, the, the, that you're going to dance because just to find the word uh, C, S E A, which is a word for someone like me living in California, it's common. But sometimes you're going to spend three days just looking for the word C. So uh, writing for me, like in Broken Glass, was like uh, a challenge of writing. So Finally, all my writings are about writing. How to deal with someone who is trying to write in order to testify the realities of his continent. 
And Ivan, uh, about dust, I mean, it's such a, a full novel encompassing so much uh, history and multitude of characters um, from the Mau Mau period to the 2007 election violence, right? W w how, how was this novel born? How did it come about in your mind? Was it after the, uh, the, the violence of 2007? Uh, not really. No. Um, it started around uh, 2005 uh, when uh, uh, Kenya went through its you know, uh, first referendum. And uh, I was very conscious that the narrative that the press was putting out in terms of the state of the country was not the reality um, I would hear on the streets. Sometimes I'd walk the streets and just eavesdrop. I do a lot of that. And, <laughs> and I'd remember getting extremely um, uh, nervous and the, the sense that if we did not speak, if, we, if, if as a country we were not able to articulate uh, the things that were actually being said on the streets and deal with them. That was 2005, I say that. Uh, we were rushing towards a precipice. I was so frightened that we were going to detonate, which we then did in 2007. Adwell, I, I wanted to ask you about the nonfiction book about Nigeria in the 21st century. Um, you, you tell me about the, you were telling me before about this philosophy, the Yoruba idea that was this code of transformation. And you want to tell us just a little bit about the idea? Well, the easiest way to explain <laughs> it is that Martin Luther King talks about the importance of the content of character. Now, before there was the advent of money, character was the fundamental things, thing that defined wealth. The quality of your character defined who you are, it defined who would help you in your farm, it, defi it de defined who you could trade with. And so content of character as a way, let me, let me back up a little bit. The real challenge is how do you organize or modernize the African continent in a manner that's consistent with our own dreams? What prompted the book? What was happening in Nigeria or the continent? across the continent, but essentially what I've been working on outside writing is the, the fundamental pursuit of African excellence. How do you pursue excellence when, you're, when you are, the world tells you you're inferior? How do you pursue excellence when the framing of your own society is dependent on you learning another language of thought or language of expre expression before you can be considered capable? Um, and so my own sense of the African continent is that we were skilling our people, the everyday people, to participate in this challenge of forming a new dream, a new possibility. Because they first have to learn English or French, they have to learn other people's culture in order for them to participate in what is a fundamental part of transformation, of affecting their lives. So I started looking at how do you organize differently and what is the design of the Africa that we'd like to see. And, and character defines everything to me the quality of the character, the content of the character, the evolution of the character. So the concept of Omoluabi is about character plus choices defines your destiny. That's what the work is about. And, um, uh, Ivan, you, your work is set in Kenya, but um, Alan, let me ask you, is, are your books set in Congo, Brazzaville, or is it an invented, invented landscape that you've created? No, actually, I never hide my country. Uh, yeah, I can stand the writers who try to say it's set in a country we don't know. Uh, just be there. If I want to write about the Congo, it's an honor to write a book written by my people. If I'm a writer, it's just because of thanks to the Congolese people. Why I'm going to try to create a kind of no man's land in which people are talking a kind of uh, broken language. No, I'm going to write with my Congolese flow. It was like, um, it was a challenge for me last, uh, in 2010, I had to translate uh, uh, the book from uh, Izondima Iwela, Beast of yeah, No yeah. Nation. Oh uh, yeah, you, you translated that. In yeah. French, yes, from the Edition Olivier, because yeah. Just because in Which France, is Nigeria, yeah. in France, all, all the translators rejected the book because of the language. It was uh, like broken pidgin and so on and so on. So I read the book in the pidgin. So I say that I don't need to translate the pidgin from Nigeria. I have just to give his narrator 
the Congolese way of speaking. So it was a book fit for a writer. So if you read Isondima Iweila in France, the sound is Congolese. But if you read Isondima in English, the sound is from Nigeria and so on and so on. So I think that uh, sometimes we have to be proud of our countries, even if we, we are in the darkness, like some people say, but I'm a Congolese, I'm proud to be a Congolese. And my novels, uh, so my novels are also sometimes Congolese, and they follow the way I'm living. If I live in California, oh, let's go over there. Let's try to give a little taste of Congolese way of living in California. We're going to do that. In Paris, so, Paris as well? Yes, so Broken Glass is in the bars in the Congo Brazzaville. Memoir de Portrait as well, Bleu Blanc Rouge, uh, Blue White Red, because of the fact that I moved from Congo to France and from France to United States. Uh, all Lumière de Pointe Noire. Pointe Noire, which is like uh, the second city in the Congo, the lights of Pointe Noire. So I saw Congolese people say that, oh, thank you for making notes throughout the world the name of my native city. That's good. So why I'm going to change the name of Pointe Noire just in order to be in the wave, in order to be uh, celebrated like someone who is doing the word literature, which is men, which mean that uh, you're trying to wash your body in order to appear more, uh, less black and more white. So this is not my way of uh, thinking. If I have to write Congo, I'm going to write Congo sometimes with C-O-N-G-O, sometimes with K, like the kingdom of the Congo at that time. I wanted to ask you about language. I mean, both you and Yvonne, you, you really kind of recreate, you, what you do with the English language is very unique, and what you do with French, you, right? I mean, uh, broken glass has no punctuation besides uh, commas, right? But yes. tell me about the language, how you reinvented French and how, what you've done to English in dust. Yes, broken glass uh, doesn't have like uh, punctuation, just uh, the, the comma. I used only the comma, just because of the, I'm from the Bembe uh, tribe in the Congo. So the, when someone is like telling a story, he doesn't stop, you know? When we are talking here, we don't use the punctuation. I'm not like say, say, saying that I'm gonna speak uh, comma and I'm gonna tell a full stop. No, we just speaking and the punctuation is just uh, suggestive. Uh, we are thinking about so I say to myself why I'm gonna be like uh, uh, I'm gonna put punctuation in this uh, book written by a narrator who is drinking every day like in the Palmoil drinker from uh, from, from Tutuola. Amos Tutuola he's drinking every day and telling the lives of the other people so if you are drinking the Punctuation is like uh, something which is far from that. You need your glass of wine and you need to tell the story at that time. So broken glass is at the same time uh, I try to break the language and I try to break the way of uh, telling the story in my own tribe, which is the Bembe. My mother used to be a storyteller, so I knew how uh, she used that to keep the audience like uh, awake by the fact that by the tone my mother punctuation is the tone is not a sign that the difference uh, what with the tone not uh, not with the sign and Yvonne tell, tell me about the writing of dust I'm, I mean it's a very idiosyncratic writing of English fragmented mm. Oh, oh, the, fra oh the, the fragmented style. Well, um, I, I'm, uh, I, I, I don't know where to start with this. Well, I'll say maybe, first of all, I'm fascinated by um, the malleability of language, but and also particularly English, and the, what English has become in the different landscapes in which it has found itself. Um, so uh, in another forum, I speak about Englishes, and, uh, and 
um, I imagine dust. Uh, I, hear, I hear, heard the story very much as a, a story of the landscape uh, um, that informs in the Kenyan landscape, landscape and use the, the way of speaking um, that is of, of, of that particular space, uh, the English that becomes of, of the Kenyan landscape. So um, I don't know if that's what you're kind of asking, but yeah. But you mix English with Gukuyu and other language. I, I I write I write I write the story the way Kenya speaks English. Mm -hmm. We we tend to be trilingual on mm -hmm. average. Every Kenyan tends to be trilingual, and we traverse um, uh, the spaces of language, um, uh, so, so we can have a conversation and uh, and four different languages will cross a particular path in order to communicate something. Beautifully written, wonderful book. Thank you. Really, I, I was curious uh, about your work, your work outside writing, how that affects your writing, or how, how you balance the two, or, or they feed off each other. The peace initiative work. Well, Does that relate to your, to, and, and also the TV show, the, right? Well, they're all stories. Um, everything we do is about stories. You know, when you go into a classroom to teach, you're telling stories. When you go to land, you're telling stories. When you or you're engaging stories. When you go into the market, you are involving stories. So I, I find that I don't restrict myself in the kind of story I tell, the story I tell with my life, the story I tell with the people I interact with, the story I, I tell as a columnist, the story I, I tell with nonfiction, and the story I'm trying to tell with fiction. But the, at the core of everything I write are two core principles. One is that I'm worthy of my own love for myself and everybody else should experience that, their own kind of love. And secondly, that I, you can see the same thing with many different lenses. And so, so long as I'm expressing myself with an authentic lens, it doesn't have to be a lens that I, I believe in, it doesn't have to, but it's authentic, then I have something to say. I have something unique or something different to say. And, and I'll say it in any forum or any media. But for example, the TV show, the reality TV show, what, what are some of the storylines? Well, essentially it's about the Niger Delta, which is the oil producing region of Nigeria. And for many years there was conflict in the Niger Delta. And um, the conflict ended with an amnesty, but there were young people who had grown up within that conflict. And whose sense of solution or character was really their grand narrative was about the conflict. So we were trying to open up new narratives. So we taught them to be filmmakers. We taught them to find stories of their own. We taught some to be journalists, and we were covering the transition. Um, as m myself as the lead in that, covering the transition from where they started from to where we wanted them to be. We, we started to engage them so that by the time we had the elections a few months ago, that we would have a different language of change, that we'd be talking about transformation in a non-violent way, and we'd be looking for solutions in the stories that they're telling because as much as everybody looks at those conflicts as defining the region, there are millions of people who wake up every day who still have to do the very basic thing everybody else in the world is doing. Find money, feed families, struggle for, for food, go to the market. And their story is as important. But there is a way in which we have specialized in telling the story of the violent and ignoring the millions of people who are not violent. And it seems that we're rewarding those people. So that, and, and from that also, my own experience also evolved. Um, my, me experiencing them, my own story as a Yoruba man walking in the Niger Delta, who's not of that ethnicity, learning a new language, learning new interaction, and learning how I was perceived. And that's been, that's been a very powerful transformation for me. And it's been two years, you said? The yes, programming? Two, years, two years. Well, I wanted to ask one, one other question from, from the cards. And I'll start with you, Alan, at the end. In your own words, what are, what are some of the es essential ideas or themes that drives your works? What, it, what is at the core of what you're writing, Alan? The themes. Yeah, what, what is central to what, what is central drives your writing? Are uh, there ideas that? I think that um, is, um, I try to uh, replace myself in the middle of that world which is like uh, 
shaking every day. It is like uh, looking that everything uh, is like uh, going away. So I look for usually the character was disturbed and I try to find how they can be happy in the disturbers that broken glass that mm -hmm. African psycho they look uh, mm -hmm. lost mm -hmm. they look uh, like uh, broken but at the end of uh, the day they are happy they are laughing I don't want to depict a kind of uh, dark Africa. Even when I'm dark, I manage to keep a little uh, la laugh yeah, somewhere. You certainly use so humor. We can say that irony, laughing, and maybe uh, disturbance. <laughs> Turbulence. Turbulence. <laughs> Thank you. And Yvonne, when, when you think of your, your novel and your works, I guess um, I, um, I entered into the world of story to grapple with the questions that uh, I have um, about life. And it's the beginning of the fundamental questions. What does it mean to be human? Um, in, perhaps sometimes in a particular time. Um, what, does it, what, you know, what does it mean to be human in a time of ISIS, for example? <laughs> or, uh, um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm a coward, so I put, like, so since I'm a coward and I let my character go through the things that I wouldn't dare go through. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's it's mostly around that, so those around that particular question do all my themes evolve. And can I ask you, are you working on another fic work now? And, yes, and when you, you won the Kane Prize yeah, early, Kane. was that for, was that the beginning of Dust? No, no that was no, something no, that very was, that different. That was something else, yeah. A yeah. short story? Uh, uh, yeah, long short story. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Nadwele, is there a cent well, central idea in your work that's driving it? Well, disruption. I yeah. mean, disruption from complacency, shifting people's lives. Um, certainly trying to ensure that people don't get into what I call equilibrium, because that means death. So just really creating spaces where people can actually look at the same thing from a different perspective. And yeah, that's the central thing of everything I do. Thank you, all three of you. And, and I wanted to open it up to the uh, audience now. If there's any questions in the audience uh, for the three writers. Yeah? I went there. <laughs> I actually, I love, I love Northern Kenya. And um, uh, selfishly, I'm glad a lot of Kenyans don't know about it because I, I kind of call it my little secret. But it's not going to be a secret anymore. Oil and all that for oil and, uh, you know, wind and all of those things. Um, but, uh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I've, got, I've got a rather, I've got a high maintenance muse and d that demands that I actually go to the place that I want to write about. So I went there. Uh, but about the other research, uh, there's always a temptation, you know, you, uh, I, I will I will talk a little bit about that. Um, so I could research uh, Northern Kenya, then I could research sand, and then the meaning of sand, and you, it, went, it went on and on. It's very, very, very fascinating process that also contributes the, to the procrastination journey. <laughs> are, are you from Nairobi? Uh, yeah, I am, I am a Nairobian, yeah. Questions? Yeah. I think, <laughs> but no, not really. Yeah, that, that was that was the, that's how the story emerged. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, there. Well, I'm actually tr right about what I feel passionately about and what I think might be the thing that has to be addressed. So sometimes you just get this thing in your head. So, for example, I'm obsessed about Baltimore. And, and Baltimore keeps on playing, and I play Nina Simone's Baltimore. I hear what she was saying. And it, it, it connects with something, I feel, about the crisis of masculinity across the world. And, and so that, that keeps on playing in my head. And once it gets into my head and I can't get rid of it, I'll have to write a column or write a poem or write a play or something has to be written. It has to come out of my system. That way I move from being the subject of that thing to making the thing object. And, and that's what I try to do. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, well, I, I he said it well. I write what I'm passionate about or what obsesses me. A question can obsess me. Um, and um, it does not exclude the political question at all. I think everything you want to write is political anyway. Because even if you are writing about someone who is begging money somewhere over it, it's a political problem. So it depends. In the 60s, it was clear. When you're reading, like, uh, I don't know, Mongo Betty from Cameroon, you know that he's uh, like requesting something, not by using poetry, but he's going straight. But now we have uh, like uh, a way of expressing it with uh, all means, uh, which are soft sometimes, but we still have uh, political writers, I think, about. Uh, when I know from Kenya, yourself, uh, uh, Abdurrahman Waberi from, from Djibouti, uh, Patrice Ganong from Cameroon, and so on. We still have uh, this kind of uh, energetic uh, writers who are going to speak and write uh, uh, deeply. But I can't imagine someone writing a novel just in order to depict the snow, how it's great. Uh, and how the birds uh, are singing differently today compared to yesterday. It's always something, uh, yeah. Mm. Oh, y yeah, this question. I like the word self. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this work um, because it, it just it just won't go away. I'm trying to write in the first voice of a woman, and it is mind blowing for me. There are times when she makes all the sense, and I could feel her, I could express her, I could walk around and think like her. And there are times when I just don't get her. <laughs> she's just she's just not there. And I'm also writing in the voice of. Uh, woman who is actually African but of European d descent. So she's Yoruba, she's not Nigerian. So, you know, anybody who knows Nigeria knows about Susan Wenger, who, who was an artist in Oshogo. So I'm writing about the commune and the child of that commune. So it's also very difficult because this person culturally is very different from me. So I'm trying to discover that voice. And, and so it's all over the place at the moment. But it's also exciting. Um, maybe it wouldn't get published. <laughs> I'll just dump it and walk away. But I'm excited by the process in itself. Um, if you've got a wooden object, cut, please hold on to it for me. <laughs> you know, touching wood. Um, don't tell the muse. Uh, the last time I told the muse, you know, I, I said that this is what I'm writing, and I thought I was going to finish it in five months. That was seven years later. <laughs> so, in secret. Um, I actually, I'm, um, I'm working on a new novel. I've 
seen the beckon of the, you know, of the last full stop. Um, an Indian Ocean story, I was looking at that particular space within the African space, the African Indian Ocean. Um, it's a coming of age story. And because I'm passionate about the Indian Ocean, um, it feels very indulgent and it feels like I'm eating fudge all the time. So, but I hope uh, the publisher will like it. W where, do you, where do you have to travel to research this book? Sorry. Where have you had to go to? Oh, uh, well, I lived in Zanzibar for a while and then I'm off to, oh, such suffering, Pate Island, uh, Lamu, Lamu. Um, then uh, uh, I need a brief uh, incursion into Turkey and China. And Alan, I mean, you can say what you're working on now, but also what's coming out in English, because we're yes. behind. We're behind on your works, right? Yes, I have a translation of my book, Lumière de Pointe Noire, which is going to be The Lights of Pointe Noire, which is my return in the Congo 23 years later. A it's novel or memoir? It's a mix of novel of memoir. So it's going to be released here in the United States uh, on March by the new press. I think Kyle is here. Mm -hmm. The publisher. Next spring. And by the meantime, for the French reader, I'm uh, releasing a novel on August in France called The Petit Piment, which is the story of uh, a kind of uh, Congolese Robin Hood over there. It's a version of Robin Hood from the Congolese perspective that's going to be released in France uh, on August. And in England, you've had books published that haven't come out here, UK, right? The, the UK Serpent's yes. Tale books, right? They're going to release The Lights of Pointe Noire. The, the other one May. is the um, mm -hmm. Tomorrow I'll Be 20, is it? Done already. It's all the already UK. done. The Lights of Pointe Noire. Yeah. There's a question here, yeah. For me, you know, actually, there are two languages that compete. So I, I think sometimes in Yoruba, and sometimes I dream in that language. It depends on which country I'm in. I dream in Yoruba and then speak it out in English. But actually, sometimes it's Pidgin. You know, especially because I live in the Niger Delta, Pidgin is very easy. It captures something that I don't think English or Yoruba captures about, about what is evolving. And actually, is you know, creolized English, so it's across the continent, in a way. So, those are the two languages I I, I think, in. and so I struggle with the full stop as well, mm -hmm. because <laughs> because you know I'm almost a more someone who speaks to something rather than um, um, the story comes in my head first, then I start to edit it down and try to try to put it in a more linear language. Actually, now that you ask, I haven't thought of which language I think in. <laughs> there seems to be a kind of in-between blurry space of uh, in-between language and, and languages. But uh, probably all, um, Eng well, probably I, s I probably think the way I grew up where, uh, with the very conscious awareness of two languages, Luo, the Luo, and English at the same time. I don't think I thought there was a difference between English or Luo. I probably that's, that's probably how I think as well. I think it, it bend because we are like 4 million in the Congo, but we have like uh, 42 major languages. 42. So in order to be in peace, you have to speak like 10. <laughs> uh, I speak just seven of them. So because my mother has her own languages, and the language which is Bembe, my father is Kenge, but my uncle and my aunt, they have the teke. So we speak all those languages. At the same time, I'm not thinking about the fact that what about French? For me, French is like a, an African language. I found it on the street when I was a kid in the Congo. So it's like uh, the Bembe. So it's just because it's uh, a little bit cold because of the winter or something. 
But uh, <laughs> for me, just an African language is, which came over there for, with the shame of the colonization and so on and so on. And then, if I had to write something, I need maybe to mix so, uh, my own sources so that French people are going to say, oh, he's trying to invent our language. But it's not their language. It's just my language I'm trying to uh, create the way of, of explaining my thought otherwise uh, in order to be in, pay, in peace among those languages. So I don't think that my French is the same French than Michel Houellebecq or Christine Angot, the major French writer over there. My French does have something which is like the dust of mm -hmm. the Congo, mm -hmm. to, to quote your test. I have that dust, which is very important. It's going to give me my, my own way of dancing. They dance over there with two foot, two feet. I dance with just one. <laughs> so that's fine for me. My French is like that. But it, it does remind me of some of the writing like Patrick Chamaswa in the Caribbean, some yes. of the Creolite writing. Yes, Patrick like, Chamazo or yeah. Raphael Confion mm -hmm. with the way of using the Creole. And you can go even in Haiti with the other one, or in Nigeria. I don't think that the English my colleagues are living in the, the, the same. It's not Shakespeare uh, uh, or, or no, no, John Le Carré. No, it's uh, something uh, when I'm reading like Chinua Achebe, I'm not reading in English. People think that I'm reading in, no, I'm reading another language. Each time a writer is writing something, he is inventing a language. Even in Yoruba, if the day you're going to write your novel in Yoruba, you're going to find a, someone who is 80 years who's going to say it's Yoruba, but not Yoruba. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was thinking while you were speaking about how I use please. Yeah. You know, um, I would say, please help me do something, which is really Yoruba. Yoruba, you know, and, and, and using we, you know, a, a collective when actually speaking to someone who's older. So and when I write it, it have to, it'll have to come out that way. So, so it's not. So there is my English. <laughs> and there's Nigerian English, yeah. More questions? How about right here? Person. Well, my novel is in the first person, which is what one of the reasons why it's extremely difficult, uh, because you're exploring the internal geography of that person, and you're also trying to communicate that in a way that's very intimate. Um, but I, I, I think, well, I used to write plays. That's what I, and that was a voice, very powerful one, on the stage. Um, so if I talk about Abyssinia. Abyssinia had to be in that, that kind of first-person narrative um, um, quality. So I'm kind of used to that. And then when I started writing my novel, people started saying, oh, that's so difficult. Why did you choose that? Well, that's what I'm comfortable doing. And that's what I'm comfortable exploring because I always want to explore the complexity of what I'm, 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 I'm saying to people. I want you to see what's going on internally and externally. But I suspect that people write depending on what the what the what the story is how the story is imagined for them. That's what I think. Yeah, I, I think that well said it quite well. Uh, for my own process and it is something I had to learn the very hard way, frankly, um, uh, you know when they say when some well, I had a teacher that said long ago, get the hell out of the way of the story. I didn't understand what that meant. <laughs> But having gotten the hell out of the way of the story, um, uh, one of the other things I had to learn with great difficulty was to listen. And sometimes, it's, uh, so it depends then on how the story then emerges. So when I was writing Dust, I thought it was first person. But when I got the hell out of the way of the story, it was a third person narrative, so, yeah, as is the second story. Yeah. Okay. 
think it, it, it's a feeling. The first person is the easiest way to go because you're, you're going to be the character in it. But the best way to avoid to be the first person is to do like uh, I, I've done sometimes. That I'm going to talk about the writer who is writing. So he's going to be the first person using the je, uh, I, but I'm behind. Uh, I'm the third person. The first person is good because the narrator going to be inside the story. But if you use the third person, the narrator is going to be outside. So you need to be a god in order to figure out everything. How do you, you know, no, he's going over there in order to buy something. He did that, he did that. Where did you get that information? But if I say, I'm going, then the reader is with me. It's easy for me to go over there. So it depends on what I want to express. If uh, sometime I'm writing an historical novel, it's easy for me to go on the third person because I'm going to have a lot of documentation and so on and so on. So I'm going to be, like we say, omission. I know everything, but I know everything, but you don't know who I am. But if I'm a je, I, you're going to say, oh, this is the writer. And he's not anymore a writer, he's the reader. Because when you are reading my novel in which I say I, you're going to be I. But if it's he, you are not anymore he. It's distant. So it depends if I want you to be intimate with me. If you want uh, you to come with me, then I'm going to use uh, the first person, which is uh, maybe the more complicated, but at the same time, technically, the easiest. Yeah. Did you have a question? For me, uh, <laughs> you know, it's okay. Um, you know, Yoruba, so yes, <laughs> I, I, you know, um, actually, you know, usually I say Amiba, I don't know Yoruba, but that's a different conversation for a different space. Um, but I'll talk about Ibadan. And there's something we call Rara, which is um, poems that capture the essence of the spirit of the moment, tells history and covers both history and the sense of being. And there's a gentleman who is about 85 and is the last of the Asuraras, is the last of those people um, who would come at about 6 a.m., stand at a distance from the house, put a hand to his ear to get the ac acoustic um, right, and then start to tell me the history of my grandfather, my great grandfather, and all of that. And I, I, did a small video about this for myself because I wanted to capture that. Having lost my parents very early on, he's the only person that knows the history of my people, of, of my own family, of my own clan. So I think that there's something about losing a lot of those powerful things, those cultural, rather than tradition, because I think tradition is lazy. It's a very lazy thing to say, my father did this, I'll do it. But culture is powerful, it's very dynamic. And there are so many things that speak very powerfully to the sense that Africa has something really special, that the world will lose something if those things disappear. And so I, I, I have a very strong sense of that. And, but at the same time, what do we do? Um, there's a, we were talking on NPR today, and there was a talk about having academies to capture some of these things. But they're too dynamic for that. They're not things that should go into museums. They should things that 
should be academic. They're things that need to be practiced. They're crafts. They're exciting crafts. So, well, one of the things I'm taking away from New York is how do we, how do we keep those things? Not to make them exotica, but to actually give them life and to give them meaning in the 21st century. Did you want to add something, Yvonne? Yeah, actually, um, I think I, 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 I would, uh, I would uh, defer a little. It's a whole, th I think the question of if a tree falls in the forest and you're not there, um, did it fall or did it not? But the voices have always been there. And just because, uh, and the West is only taking interest in it now because China is interested in Africa. That's my <laughs> opinion, frankly. Uh, really, that's, that's a reality. Uh, we were never interesting until China found out, until we improved China's economy. Uh, voices have been there, um, and whether whether we just happen to be in the current, uh, in in the flow, um, something's happening. Our stories are suddenly interesting, um, but uh, I don't know. Quite frankly, I don't think we care that anyone pays attention. Anyone paying attention here? It just and our books are selling. That's why we're here. <laughs> it's not no one's doing anybody a favor, really. Um, and like I say, the voices have always been there. Whether we notice them or not is quite irrelevant. Thank you, Ivan. Anybody, did I see? Thank you. Right here? And then in the back. Tackling multiple voices as a narrator. Is that for Ivan or anyone on this multiple voice? I'll start again, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the one um, thing I've written that I like all the voices um, and also different timeline is Abyssinia. And in Abyssinia, you were talking about the Emperor Trodra's time and, and he was talking about the, the invasion of the British. And it's based on a true story um, of the Prince of Abyssinia who's buried in the in the grounds of Windsor Castle, and who was adopted by Queen Victoria. So we had, I had to write three different eras. One was the 18th century, and then the later 18th century, and then the 21st century. Um, and they ran parallel to each other. So um, the narrator would be talking in the 21st century, but was dealing with something that happened before, and something that was imagined, that, that happened to the son afterward. And I think it, it's, as was described earlier, that when the story is imagined, you're always looking for the, the, the voice that is fit for purpose, the voice that articulates and, and, and hopefully has that elegant simplicity to communicate what you're trying to say without it being contrived. And so I think that voices can multiply um, based on that. So for me, it is who's telling the story and who best tells the story. And it's all, I d actually, I don't think that's really unusual if you look at life. You know, when you're experiencing something, there are so many roles that you play. So I play a role as a father, I play a role as a husband, I play a role as a writer. And when I'm saying something, there's another voice still saying the same thing in a different way. You know, it, it's always happening. So in, in trying to express those things, sometimes it's required to express them in that layered way. I can't resist it. I hear voices, said the village man. <laughs> I hear voices, said the village man. man. I hear voices, said the writer. <laughs> um, uh, in, the, in the process of writing, certainly for me, it's, it's fascinating how one <coughs> enters into a, a, a world that's um, occupied and inhabited by all sorts of people. And um, they have their ways and voices and tones and and I like so I think one of the the hardest but I think the one of the best lessons I have learned in the writing process was listening. Um, eavesdropping quite a bit um, in order to uh, uh, be truthful to the variety of voices uh, that emerge in the process. Thank you. Well, the thing that um, it's also the the freedom of the character in the novel is going to dictate you the, this kind of uh, multiple voices in uh, your writing. And even if in the novel it looks like uh, just one 
character is trying to explain the story, but if you look closely, you're going to hear a lot of other voices who are over there. So not everyone can like uh, handle the voices like did uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Neypol, or uh, uh, Faulkner, and so on and so on. Uh, it's good to put uh, uh, tons of voice in your novel, but how are you going to deal with them? So I think that um, each time, if I can limit the number of the voice, that's what I do. I said, okay, just take that voice and give the end of voice, in end of voice, and so on and so on, in order to be like the master of what you are like saying. Too much talk can like destroy what you are writing. In the back, I think we have time for one or two more questions. In the back. of the box, the look of the box. The, the design is the book is uh, it's a kind of uh, anglophone practice. We don't know that in France. Well, know? that's the thing. Uh, your, you know? your edition of Broken Glass, the French edition is just... Yes, but the translation, you know, in France... But the uh, English one I is the illustrated cover. Yes, when I publish a novel in France at Gallimard or Le Seuil, they don't put uh, Le Clés, you say that this is the greatest... Uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Because people are going to say, yes, 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 but we need to check. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the problem. But your culture here yeah, as yeah. reading that you need to be like uh, a companion. You know, no? yes, uh, maybe uh, you are with it. Look, uh, Nepal said that about it. Oh, I'm going to buy it. But in France, we are like relatives. You know, like, hmm. Modiano said that, no. Maybe he drank that day. I'm uh, going to try. <laughs> yes. So we don't uh, like uh, use this kind of package over there. But here, it's important to do that, you know, everything. At the time, I think in the 70s, <coughs> the book has, like, in Galima, you have just the name, Le Clésio, the title. Do you have it right there? What? My, my book? Oh, uh, the down. French one? Oh, it's over there. <coughs> I think, here, yes, yes. Yes, you have just, uh, it's uh, like that. You have just the name. <laughs> The title. And the back. And in the back, the photo. <laughs> the no verbal, nothing. And they're going to throw you on the, like, <laughs> on the store like that. And someone's going to read. That's it. But if it was in the United States or the UK, they're going to put uh, John Le Carré, uh, Welbeck, uh, uh, my mother, uh, and so, so, uh, uh, he's professor in UCLA. So he's like going to put everything here. So the package, I like that. You know? It's okay for the, for the sake of writers. Sometimes need uh, to be like encouraged. You know, uh, if you don't read me, you're, you're losing something. You know, I'm the best of my generation, but you're not uh, taking care. So <coughs> I'm okay <coughs> as long as it's here. Even in France, you know, when I published uh, the book called uh, Tomorrow I Will Be 20, Gallimard wanted to put uh, a kind of uh, cover with a kid uh, who is like running. And I said, no, mm -hmm. just publish it like that. Because why? I have to attract some. It's not our culture over there in France. So the book is like, uh, if I see a book in a bookstore with the name, it's already a bird. I'm okay. Oh, it was published. I need to discover. I don't need to be like uh, forced by someone who's gonna say, if you don't read that, you are a dumb. Uh, you're gonna do as a no. So I accept that. I'm saying, well, as my publisher is here, he's about <laughs> to publish the book. He said, what are you saying? <laughs> Okay, so it's okay for me. You, know, you can put all the burgers. By the way, if you can put for my next book, I'm going to be glad. <laughs> <laughs> Ivan, were you involved in the 
design of this? I wasn't, but uh, I absolutely enjoyed the process by which uh, it was arrived at. It felt like, uh, um, I guess, uh, in a kind of ritualistic sense. It, it was part of the ritual mm -hmm. of the completion, and I uh, absolutely loved it. I relished it. I, I relished <laughs> it, <laughs> and I'd do it again. <laughs> yes, no, it, was, uh, it was lovely. One more? We have time? Let me just we, we let me just quickly yes. respond to this. Yes, yes. I was involved in this. Yeah. Until you said that, I I <laughs> I, I, I didn't feel I felt really proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking now, <laughs> why should I have been? But actually, there was we were tr I I I was the one that designed it. I wanted some code words in it. So if you look at it, you see code words in Yoruba around it. And um, yeah, it's a story of an idea. So I didn't. I, I, didn't, I didn't mind doing that. And I actually looked for people I respected to write the blog. I didn't leave it to anybody. So I went looking for people I knew that I respected. And I said, OK, I want you to say something about this. Read this and tell me what you think. Now, maybe next time <laughs> I'll think differently. But certainly, you know. Well, thank you, all three of you. I mean, it's been a real pleasure. Alan, Ivan, Adoele.